Yes, I was with the 445th Bomb Group of the uh, 2nd Division of the 8th Air Force, and I went overseas as a co-pilot. Uh, during the time that I was overseas, I checked out as a first pilot. However, I flew basically as a co-pilot while I was there. Tell me how old you were and where you were living when you joined the war. Um, I was 21. It was, I was uh, in, at Stanford University in the engineering school, and I was in my last year when the war started. Uh, I was in the ROTC program, so uh, I was 21 at the time, and I went in the service in the ground force in uh, uh, June, June 10th, actually, 1942. And my birthday is in August, so I was 21. I would have been 22 another month. You mentioned you went in the ground force. Can you tell me a little bit about why you did that and, uh, and then how you ended up in the, the uh, Army Air Corps? Yeah, I, uh, in, uh, at Stanford we had uh, basic field artillery and, and ordnance as ROTC requirements. Um, we started out with two years of field artillery, and this was a French 75 uh, horse-drawn in those days. And uh, then being in engineering school, why ordnance was a natural, so uh, we went into the ordnance reserve. Uh, I only received orders uh, but was never actually in ordinance because right after uh, June 10th when I was uh, brought in as a reserve officer, a second lieutenant, I was transferred to the Signal Corps of the U.S. Army because the Signal Corps was short on people and they needed uh, a lot of people in a big hurry. So I went from there uh, to Fort Monmouth, New Jersey for three months of retraining and then from there out to the Desert Training Center in Southern California. This was when Patton, this was in the summer of 42, and of course Patton was in Africa, and we followed right behind him, and we worked uh, uh, tank with the tank corps with the idea of going to Africa to back up Patton. Uh, what happened, as we all know, is that Patton and Montgomery uh, uh, brought that uh, desert War to a conclusion, and there we were working maneuvers in the desert, uh, running up and down chasing tanks, really. And uh, so a, a group of us uh, felt that uh, we wanted to do something exciting and we wanted to get into the action, and we all we could see is we were going to be out in the desert kind of ignored. So uh, a bunch of us went in. Uh, actually, it was Blythe Air Force Base when we first got acquainted with the Air Corps, and I believe that was a B-24. It was either B-24 or 17 base at that time. And we had been chasing tanks up and down the desert in maneuvers, uh, eating out of sea ration cans and living in slit trenches. And we had a, a few days off, and we went to Blythe Air Base, and we walked into a, a nice warm mess hall, a nice warm food, and we couldn't believe it. There were about a half a dozen of us. And uh, there was a crew ahead of us in the chow line, and one of them said to the other, oh, it's, it's fried chicken again. Let's go downtown and get a steak. Well, we hadn't seen fried chicken for weeks, you know. So uh, then we got, we sat at the tables, and there was a crew that were going to go on a training mission. They said, you know, fellas want to come along. So we, so we did. We uh, climbed in the waist of, I presume it was a B-24, you know, in those days, uh, being in the ground force, I guess they all looked the same, four-engine bombers. And we thought, gee, this is great, you know, it's a nice, nice clean uh, fuselage to sit in and you're getting paid for it. And uh, so after that, the next chance we had, why we uh, applied for transfer to the Army Air Corps. Now that was the story. And uh, in those days, you could not, they wouldn't release you from your own outfit, but there was a provision that you could bypass channels and go directly and apply directly for either paratroop school or, or uh, flight uh, crew school. So uh, some of the fellows went into paratroops and the rest of us went into the Air Corps. Tell us about your arrival in England. Uh, we went over by ship and we went over as a single ship. This was in December of 44. And uh, all I remember about it was that we started out from, uh, I think it was Camp Miles Standish in uh, Massachusetts. 
and it was cold. This would have been what around November, first part of December, forty-four. And then after a day or two out, a single ship. Uh, it was very, very warm, and we wondered, you know, where are we are we going to the South Pacific? And obviously, it must have been down towards South America. And then a few days later, it became very, very cold again, and so. Uh, all I remember then was arriving in England and it was cold and wet, so we had a pretty good idea that uh, by that time where we were. When you arrived at your base, what was it like? What, did, what was your reaction to the base? Uh, I, I really can't recall except I do recall that was the winter of 44. I do recall it was terribly cold, terribly wet. Uh, the conditions were so much different from the states. Uh, There's no hot water. Uh, the huts weren't well uh, where, where we slept and, and lived were, were not well heated and uh, uh, that was just a terribly cold winter all the way around. And that, that is the part I remember. I remember also that after a few missions why well, I, I got a bad case of flu and I was had to be in the infirmary for a period of time because of that, and so did my tail gunner, too. Tell us about your first mission. <clears throat> Our first mission was, was kind of a kick because, uh, of course, when, you're, when you find out the night before you're going on a mission, it's your first, why you uh, are pretty nervous about it. And uh, I know that uh, my crew didn't sleep well that night. I know I didn't uh, in anticipation. We didn't know where we were going to go, naturally, the, the evening before. And when we got to briefing, it turned out to be a fairly simple run into, into France. Fairly short run, and we were just absolutely delighted to, to have that as a, a starting point. Uh, we got out um, and pre-flighted the planes and uh, took off, got into formation, and got partway out across the channel. and we lost all the oil out of one of our engines. So we had to turn back from this, uh, uh, this really simple mission, in which we'd worried about so much the night before. And when we got back, we found out that somebody, and I don't know whether I as a co-pilot or, or Charlie uh, Cooper, our flight engineer, had, hadn't checked one of the lids on one of, one of the engine's oil tanks, but it was off, and that was why we lost it. That's why we lost the uh, oil. I had to turn back. What did they do about that mistake? I don't know. I imagine that we heard about it, but I don't really remember. Tell us about your most uh, dangerous mission. The one mission that we really had problems with, uh, which resulted in about a month or so away from the base, was uh, March 15th. Uh, 45. Uh, the mission was to Zossen, which was a, a uh, outskirt uh, area of Berlin, the Berlin area. Uh, it was where general headquarters of uh, the Nazi high command was supposed to be, and uh, we were to bomb that. Uh, on the way into the target, um, we got off course. Our group somehow got off course, and we went over the over Hanover. And we got hit quite badly. Several of the ships went down, and we lost uh, an engine, and then another engine finally gave out on us. So we continued on to the target, although we were lagging behind and losing altitude, and we got rid of our bomb load uh, somewhere in the vicinity of the target. Uh, it was pretty obvious that we couldn't go back uh, over uh, the continent, so we headed for uh, the Russian, the Russian direction, and uh, I give tremendous credit for Kenny Branson, our navigator, who has since was killed in the service, because he navigated us to a couple of small fighter strips in the area near Lodz, L-O-D-Z, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. They were little uh, fighter strips that had just been captured from the uh, Germans just within the last you know, two or three days and we were able to make a crash landing at one of those. And uh, interesting enough, except for some bruises and uh, cuts and that type of thing, why nobody was seriously hurt. It was an interesting little base because they had never seen Americans before. This is the first Americans these people had ever seen. 
And uh, they came out, when the plane came to rest, they came out with submachine guns and uh, they surrounded us and uh, we, uh, we couldn't speak their language, they couldn't speak ours. And <clears throat> they had, a, they had a, a lieutenant, a Russian lieutenant, who they pushed up in front and he had studied English. And all he could do was say hello, and uh, the pen of my aunt is on the table. <laughs> that type of that type of uh, of English. Now that didn't work. And then they had a, they had a, a German, uh, they had a, a Russian, a doctor who spoke German. He had to study German for his medical degree. So they tried him out. And I'd had two years of university German, and I was in the same boat as the young Russian lieutenant, all I could do was conjugate verbs and, and tell about the, the pen of my aunt. So that didn't work, but finally our, our uh, getting together what uh, occurred because Art Fetskos, one of our gunners, had grown up in the streets of New York and in a mixed neighborhood where German was spoken by some of the people, and Art was able to talk haltingly, but well enough with the German doc I mean, with the, the uh, Russian doctor who spoke haltingly German, and that's how we were able to get across the fact that we were on their side and we were Americans and uh, uh, that uh, you know, we, we didn't mean any harm. How did they treat you when you, they found out you were Americans? Uh, they treated us very well. The, uh, they had lend lease planes there. They had some C-47s they used for, for low-level bombing that were lend lease. Uh, the colonel of the base had a, uh, uh, P uh, what's it? a P-39, and there were several, there's quite a bit of American equipment, and uh, they whined and dined us at first, uh, thinking that we, and, and their whole attitude was this was American equipment and we were allies, so we really should be flying for them and their equipment. And uh, that didn't work. We kept saying, no, we had to get back. And uh, they treated us very well, but I know one of my, one of the fellows reminded me that they always had a guard uh, watching us with a, with a gun all the time. And you'd hear shots here and there and uh, from time to time. So they were, we were right close to the front lines and they didn't want to take any chances. If we'd made any moves, I'm sure that would have been it. How did you get back to the base? Um, Air Transport Command had a C-47 tour of the front lines on a every few week basis and uh, one of them came by and they saw the, the wreckage of the 24. So they came by and landed and we just piled aboard and left. We didn't bother, of course we didn't have any equipment with us so we didn't bother about uh, saying goodbye because we didn't think they let us go <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> so we went. But they had, uh, you know, they had lend lease equipment, and, and they were very good. They they threw parties for us that were just really great, and lots of vodka and, and food, and uh, all the, the whole idea was we're going to be with them. That's who we were going to be, you know, be part of their air force. Are there any other missions that you want to tell us about? No, I, those are the only ones that really stand out. The others were the usual, and I think you heard many of the other fellows talk about. Tell us about your work with the 2nd Air Division Association. Well, I joined the association uh, in, in the mid-70s. My wife and I were in England and, and uh, heard about the library, and which, of course, we all consider them a, a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, memorial. Uh, I consider it the, the finest memorial to the uh, World War II veterans that, that exist. And uh, we learned about the association then and, and came back here to the States and uh, I joined then at that time and uh, I was in the 445th Bomb Group and we didn't have much representation so I took uh, on the job of Group Vice President for them. And uh, through the years while well, I've held various positions, I held the position of President of the Association and I think it was 1981 and I'm presently secretary of the association, and we're all volunteers. It's a, I, we like the organization. They're nice, nice people. A lot, all volunteer work, and uh, I think everyone is, is just a very, very congenial. And of course, we do have 
a last mission, and that is to maintain a library to keep the hands across the sea um, concept with, with the British and, and in the hopes that uh, a better understanding of, of ourselves with the British and vice versa will promote the future of good relations and world peace, really. That, to me, that is our last mission. Our last mission is to promote a lasting peace in the world. And our library, to me, is a small way, but an important way for us to do that. Tell me what you learned most about yourself during your war experiences. Uh, I, I would say this, that I mature, matured a lot. When I went to college, I think our generation uh, were all expected, college was just a way of life. We were expected to go to, I never argued as the new generation does as to whether we ought to go or shouldn't go or should. My father said, uh, you're to you know, go to college and you get a, a profession of some sort, and I went into engineering. But I really, I really wasn't dedicated to it. I really was, was floundering around. What the, what the service did for me was it matured me. It matured me. I saw how other people lived. I saw how important education was. I saw how important it was to, to, to establish oneself in the world. And uh, when I came back, I started back to college and uh, nobody needed to prod me at all. I was going to get a master's degree and, and continue on and get a good job and establish myself in the world. And uh, to me, the, the war matured me as I believe it did many, many other people. Tell me your single uh, most significant experience that you remember from your war years. I would say the not the experience so much as the philosophy of camaraderie. I think that's something that we can't find. I don't think you can find that in any other place than in the camaraderie of people working together, um, depending on one another for their lives. Um, I think that is something that, that anybody that hasn't been in the service during wartime can ever understand, ever experience. And now, 40 years later, when we see people uh, at our convention now and at other conventions, we have, a, we have a warmth and a camaraderie that I don't believe exists any other place except where people have gone through uh, trouble and uh, hardship and uh, uh, having to depend on one another for their lives. I don't believe that exists any other place. Briefly, what's been your career since the war? Oh, after the war, I, as I said, I went back. Actually, I still had a few units in engineering to finish at Stanford, and so I applied at Stanford when I got back and said, I, you know, I'd like to go to graduate school, and I don't want to go back to un being undergraduate. So uh, they gave me credit for going through flying school toward an engineering degree, and then I went into business administration, and I got a... a uh, degree and a master's and an MBA master's in business. Um, I pursued the uh, engineering field. I went to work first for the United States Steel Corporation uh, out in California uh, as an industrial engineer. And I worked for them and worked my way up in the, in the organization and then went into uh, production management. And I worked in that until uh, the early 60s when I had to shift jobs because of family business. Tell me what you want the world and history to remember about your contribution to the war effort. I think our contribution is what I mentioned earlier, and that is peace is so important. Nobody, like, nobody likes conflict. And I think that if the lessons are learned from our war that that peace is what we're all after. I think that that's the most important thing.